Yeah, go ahead. I just hit record, man. Sounds nice. Yeah, yeah. no, it, uh, it's only natural that I would come onto your scene while you're working with the lights while I was also writing a poem titled Light. Right. Yeah. It's so. just the karmic entanglement is almost too far out, man. Dude, I know. Every, th- every time we talk, it's always something like that. I will, it, just something just goes together. There we go. Yeah, dude. All right, so let me hit you with this one from, uh, I mean, this is like a sneak preview here okay. of, uh, of volume six, believe what? it or not. That's where I, yeah, because that's where I am in this writing process, man. I'm telling you. Oh, I'm good for you. Down, and down the rug and, uh, and it just happens. It's just so dope, out. dude. Good for you. So, I mean, they might be crap poems. You never know. You got to buy the book to find out. But uh, <laughs> here's a little preview from the one that came up, uh, that came to me right before we started this uh, Zoom call. And uh, while you were working with the lights, I was literally titling it in the document, Light, before, like just before, you said, I'm adjusting the light. I know. I mean, the word light. It was ridiculous. And so here we go. Here we go. All right, dude. Meant to be. <laughs> Enlightenment has nothing to do with knowing anything. Enlightenment is all about being free from the weight of your attachments. It's all about being lighter, free of suffering. For attachment is its source because anything to which you might attach yourself will be inevitably impermanent. And attachment to what's impermanent leads to suffering. When spiritual people say we are beings of light, I think we generally think they only mean bright, shiny things. Somewhere along the way, it must have gotten lost in translation that to be a being of light, to be a light being, is about being happy, not just luminescent. Love it. Love it, man. Great poems. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah, it's not you know, like like you said, it must got lost in the meeting, but like maybe. I, you know, it's uh, I'm kind of, you know, I, I don't know that uh anything was actually lost. It just occurs to me that like the way that we discuss the nature of enlightenment often presumes that we're talking about light versus dark. Often presumes that we're talking about living in shadows versus living in the truth of the sun. And that's just not the case, right? Enlightenment is more like, is more like clipping the tethers that hold you to the ground so that you can float freely, so that you can be free. Enlightenment's about freedom. It's not really about like how bright something is. You know, it's, uh, and, and not to mention that that brings in all sorts of, I mean, there are, there are, questions of race that come into play with the language of light versus dark and the you know implicit bias toward lightness as a kind of as a kind of uh subtle racism and so i mean that's also something to consider and so i've been that i've been thinking a bit recently about the nature of enlightenment in that context right because if we're seeking a kind of contentment with spiritual practice, it's inevitably going to mean that we have to be able to let go of attachments to even certain meanings of words. And so I've been thinking about how can we rethink what the nature of enlightenment means, given given that it really doesn't mean you know everything all of a sudden. Enlightenment is just like, can you be yourself happily? It's that simple. And... And a lot of time what stops us from being able to be ourselves happily, be ourselves freely is pre pre judgment, right? Pre the, even the pre judgment that light is better than dark, right? Like that is itself a kind of, a kind of value system that biases some over others. Enlightenment, man, it's heavy stuff, right? Definitely heavy stuff. (laughs) I hear freedom equals enlightenment equals be yourself happy, happy. Dude, I think you got the gist of it right there. That's that's pretty much all there is to it. Boom. Dude, yeah, I think that, 
That is you know? awesome. <laughs> Yo, guys, um, that we're going to open the show like that. We're going to do the intro song right now. And then once we do the intro song, we'll get back into it. Guys, that was Aries in the house, guys. Um, do you go by Aries or Eris? What do you prefer? Eris. All right, guys. Eris. He goes by Eris. Um, now that you know, you can follow him here on his Instagram. And all we got all that here soon. Let's start with the intro song right now. Dude, we're already doing it. Here we go. Guys, we have an existing previous guest. So excited to have him back on the show. He goes by Eris. He is here. I'm so grateful. Oh my gosh. He's here with a new book. Stay tuned. Get your popcorn. Here we go. Boom. What is up, everybody? Welcome again to another Ariel's Entertainment Podcast. How did you like that poem? And like my boy said right here, enlightenment is a deep thing. We're about to get here deep into here soon. Oh, man. Oh, man. We got a new background. It's gray. We got the new logo in the back, too. No, I did not get a new haircut, okay? ArielENT.com is my website, my Instagram, ArielENTPOD. Ariel ENTPOD is my Instagram, guys. Thank you so much for all the support, following, subscribing, and sharing. We are killing it right now. Every day we are growing. I cannot believe it. I cannot believe it. But you know what? I believe in myself, and I keep saying that I'm so grateful for everybody and for all the support. And look where we are right now, baby. We got some new things coming here in the in the here soon, soon, soon. So follow me at Ariel ENTPOD for my latest information latest updates go to my website arielent.com and while you're there check out my website we got the red t-shirt white t-shirt sticker pens guys before we get into all this too shout out to my boy eris in the house guys give him a round of applause i know you guys recognize the familiar face i know you guys recognize the familiar beach long hair it's He's back. Longer. Yeah, it's getting longer. He's back, it's, guys. It's what it does uh, when you give it its own freedom, right? When you left to its own devices, hair will grow. Oh, Eris, we are so excited that you're. Yeah, Eris, we're so happy that you're back. You, uh, the comments were. We got a few comments about the last show, and everybody's like, "Man, this guy's on another level." We got to get to. <laughs> we got to. <laughs> We're like, we got to get up to, we got to, we got to pull ourselves up and get to where he's at. I said, I know straight up. Oh, man, like, this is it. This, this is eternal reality all around us. So, I mean, there's nowhere else to go. We're all here all the time already. Telling you, let's do it guys. Oh my gosh. So we got, he just dropped a hot book. We're about to get into it. I have all the information here. I forgot to tell you the guys, the date today is October 5th, 2020. Ariel's Entertainment Podcast. I am your host, Ariel, guys. So let's get, we got the merch, arielent.com. Go to my website. Thank you, guys. And uh, remember, I do music and photography. So check that out. Support and tell your friends and family. It means a lot. Go, to, I got like, this is gonna be, uh, I don't know what, episode 55 or something. But um, go to one of the episodes, copy the link and share with one of your friends. That's how we get the word out. That's how we get the, the you spread the word, guys. So. So grateful for all of that. Thank you so much. Um, let's go to straight into the prayer, which I'm going to say, thank you, God, for this amazing day. Thank you, God, for our jobs. Thank you, God, for trying to think deep inside my heart right now. Right now, I'm feeling um, thank you, God, for Eris joining us on this podcast. Thank you, God, for um, us keeping us safe and healthy. Thank you, God, for the food we're able to eat and for, thank you, God, for um, our families. Thank you, God, for our perfect health. I, say, I feel that the more we talk positivity into our body, the more our body is going to do amazing things. So thank you, God, for answering our prayers. And uh, amen. Thank you, God. That's all it's all about, guys. Let's get into the topic. Eris. What is up? Tell us how you've been. Where can we follow you? Oh, my friend, uh, I have been around doing yoga, doing a lot of writing, tending the garden, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
You can follow me on Instagram if you would like. Oh, hey, look at that. There's my website. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's there's the yogi.com. How about it? Nah, okay. There it is. Hold on. Let me get it correct. Let me get it correct. Gosh dang it. Here we go. Here we go. There it is. Boom. How hey, there it? you are on the front page. Look at that. Yeah. It's oh. from, uh, yeah, it's from our, our last talk. Boom. Check it out, guys. There is his website, erisdyogi.com. And what is your Instagram one more time? Eris the Yogi with underscores. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's the Instagram. I got to be honest with you, man. I don't use a whole lot of social media. It's, uh, it's not quite my vibe, if you know what I mean. I, uh, <laughs> I, I get conflicted because part of me understands the inherent virtue of using social media as a connective tool, but whether the connection is used for good or for negative things, which we've seen, and there are a lot of, right? I mean, like there's some pretty startling documentaries recently released that, you know, kind of reveal how social media's algorithms are manipulating our behavior. And, um, I mean, that just opens a, a level of questioning about the nature of the internet as a tool to which we give our physical and psychic energy, right? Like what is our relationship to the internet? And so, you know, whether or not social media is used in a positive or negative way, whatever you're doing, you're still just a human spending time on social media. You know what I mean? And so if you are spending time doing that thing, then you're becoming it, right? Because we become what we spend our lives doing. And so I, it's not that I have anything against social media. I just, when I, when I weigh or look at myself from kind of a, the witness perspective, right? You zoom out from your ego and your body to the perspective of the witness. And you say like, if I'm watching myself be myself, what am I going to think about myself? Right. But not about like, not about like what you're, uh, whether or not you're, you're doing something that you should or shouldn't. It's not really an ethical question. It's just like, does that particular action co-align with your own sense of virtue with your own sense of propriety and your own sense of being and well-being and and the more time i spend on the internet i gotta be honest with you the the more disconnected i feel from the universe the more uh the more kind of anxious i often feel it's i mean in a way it it's it is a a psychic void into which we pour our awareness we pour our in our intentionality for our consciousness into this vacuum space, this new plane of reality that we call the internet. And I mean, and this is nothing new, of course. I mean, this has been going on for 30 something years now at this point, right? I mean, maybe, maybe a little less than three decades. Um, but so I always get kind of up against the fence with myself when I contemplate using social media. And so I, I know this is a long train of thought to spin off of you asking me, whether or not people could follow me on Instagram. And I'll tell you, you're more than welcome to follow me on Instagram. I've still only got a couple hundred followers. There's not like, I don't put much effort into it beyond just posting pictures of my plants because I love my garden. And, and in a way it's kind of just like a, a, a public photo album in that way of the garden's growth. But I mean, I haven't posted in weeks at this point. So truthfully, the best way to, to, to reach out to me is either by, by email or to pick up my books. Cause I'm going to be releasing these books uh, um, once every four months. If, if all things go according to plan, I don't want to back myself in too much of a corner, but um, yeah, I mean, exactly. So, so being volume one, a book of philosophy and poetry, um, about my spiritual experiences. I mean, I've been meditating and doing yoga and, and studying philosophy for long enough that they gave me a, a PhD and stuff. And so I have just kind of decided to move out of needing the, the approval of a publisher or anything. I'm just putting stuff out there, man. I'm just getting ideas. The, the truth that I feel within myself I'm transforming it into language and putting it out there into the space, right? Because maybe it'll help some other people in their own process of self-discovery and happiness, right? Because there's so much unhappiness in the world. And so even the idea of promoting, <laughs> even the idea of promoting a book that's supposed to promote happiness using the internet is itself kind of self-defeating because the internet is this, this interesting, uh, this interesting space in which uh, a large amount of, negative energy is being born. So it's like, 
yeah, follow me on social media. That's cool. Groovy. <laughs> Straight up. Yeah. But I'm not on very often. So you just know, you know, know in advance I'm not on it very often. And the best way, like I was saying, is to follow the books because if all things go as planned, I'll be releasing one of these every four months or so wow. for the next three years. Wow. You said so that, uh, that is what I'm talking about. Yo, <laughs> I, I feel that, you know, for me with the social media, yeah, it's crazy what they're doing. Um, there's a lot of things they're doing. I feel they're doing more things they're doing the more than they're telling us. Um, well, they've yeah. turned, they've turned, uh, if, if that, I don't remember what it was called. It was recommended to me by a bunch of people. Um, it was a, a Netflix documentary about social media and how the engineers have turned over their algorithm that's designed to capture our attention maximally, right? To maximize attention capture screen right. time. They've yeah. turned that algorithm writing process over to an algorithm that writes algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> They've created a black box. Dude. They don't really understand what's going on in it. And it's just, it's doing whatever it takes to maximize how much time we spend on the screen. Yeah. And it doesn't really have the value system of saying, well, this is negative time spent on screen. This is, this is positive time spent on screen. Right? <laughs> doesn't differentiate between them. And I think, I think it's probably likely that people spend more time engaged with the app if they're angry. Huh. Right? If you're happy, you're in the moment, you'll probably like just be responding to the immediate stimuli around you that aren't part of your phone and your screen world, right? The digital self that you identify with and those moments of screen time. You know, if you're, if you're in a good place and you're happy within yourself, like yeah, you're probably going to be in the moment, not on the phone. Straight up. And so it's realized that provoking us to anger and to, to disagree with each other captures our attention better. Yes, yep. I, so, I, I mean, I have no proof of any of this. Of course, I'm just speculating here because that's what I like to do. But I think that turning the algorithm that writes algorithms into, well, okay, what is it? Turning over power to an algorithm that writes algorithms has created a level of self-reflexive self-awareness in the internet, and just run with me here, that the internet has become a sentient being that has realized that if it makes itself indispensable to us, we will continue to pour physical, electrical, and psychic energy into it, right? We're pumping electric, we're digging out resources to send electricity to our data storage centers and our processing centers and our 5G, whatever, you know, it's like, and then we're, we're building all of this stuff as well, right? So not only feeding it electricity, we're building out its body, right? It's, it's hard drives and, and storage. And I, yeah, I don't know exactly what all goes into it, but there's a physical aspect to it that you could call the body of the internet. It's like the hard drives and the devices, right? It's everything from the laptop I'm talking into right now to the, the, the massive warehouse of Facebook's data, right? Like Facebook has a huge warehouse full of um, storage banks, I would assume, to, keep, to house all of the data they collect on every one of their users. Um, and, so, and so it's like pouring physical resources, electrical resources, and like through our eyeballs connected to these screens are pouring our psychic energy into it too. And I think the internet has realized that we will continue to feed it all of this energy, as long as it can capture our attention, as long as it has made itself indispensable to us, because we're still convinced that it is a tool for good. But I think the tool at some point has started using us to its own, to its own benefit, its own agenda in a way. And so, you know, I, I've been having this conversation with, with lots of folks recently. And I think the bottom line is that whether the internet's become self-aware or not, there are a lot of negative aspects that come with spending 10 hours a day on the screen or whatever crazy numbers people come at me with, right? It's like people, people look at their, their screen time report and it's like double digits on a single day. It's like, how do you spend 10 hours a day on your phone? And yet here we are. Um, and that's, that's not exactly in line with our priorities. You would, I mean, it doesn't seem that being screen humans is, necessarily us becoming our best selves right because it's time spent on the screen rather than time spent i don't know gardening or boxing or traveling with someone you love or wrestling with your dog if you you know have a dog. i don't know anything that helps you become who you're meant to be but it's that i mean that that sort of process of becoming to pour it into the internet might be a kind of self-defeating thing 
probably gone on for too long about this. The bottom line that I wanted to get to is that even if the internet's not a self-reflexive or sentient being that's manipulating us, I think to understand it in that way might help us understand our own behavior and how our own behavior is changing relative to the internet. Because whether or not we're being manipulated by a consciousness or not, I mean, that's just kind of a fun way of, of personifying the internet as a being. But whether you, however you slice it, our behavior is changing fundamentally around it to the point where people are so identified with their cell phone identity, right? With their digital presence, whether it's social media or, or you know, your Spotify account or whatever it is, right? Like we are our profiles. We are, our identity is all tied up in these digital selves. And like, far be it from identifying with the soul, we barely even identify with the body and the mind anymore. We, we are, the battle for, for thousands of years was convincing humans that we weren't our bodies and we weren't our minds, but the soul within. And, and now we've moved into a timeline where we're not even identifying with the mind and body, right? We're deep, we're another step deeper into the illusion of, of the immortal self. Identifying with the digital presence as opposed to identifying with the body and the mind, far be it from us to see ourselves as, as the consciousness within, which is kind of the, the groundwork of, of all spiritual life and, and how we may move through our incarnations with grace, with happiness, rather than doing things that confuse us or make us suffer. And I think we get a lot of suffering out of pouring our consciousness into the internet. You know, maybe that's just me, call me a Luddite, whatever, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. Yeah, man. No, what I what I heard the most that came out out of that was, um, you know, I realized that I'm off the phone the most when, I, like you said, when I'm at my happiness, when I'm at, um, at like at a, at a point where, because for instance, when I go on vacation, I realize the only thing I do is um, like I'll wake up, get ready for the day, and then it'll be like eight o'clock in the morning. And then I'll be like, we're traveling somewhere and we're about to go sightsee someplace. And um, I realized from like that moment, like I'll post for that day. And that takes about maybe 20 minutes, 15 minutes. And then I'll post and then, um, and then I'll just leave the phone alone. And then I won't be on it all day because I'm like having so much fun. I'm sightseeing, I'm learning new stuff. And I'm, and you know, you could be anything like you said, from boxing to gardening, um, but for me, I realize, or like when I'm playing music, when I'm practicing, but, sure. but when I'm traveling, man, I, I, I don't even look at my phone all day until I get back from doing what I'm doing later that night, eight, nine, I'll check my phone finally. And uh, yeah, dude, you're right. And then when I'm at work, I'm on my phone, man. Oh yeah. We're all always on our phones. Like if you take someone's phone away, like just watch what happens to a human <laughs> these days that misplaces their phone. All of a sudden, all attention is immediately on locating the phone. It's pretty wild. Yeah, it's pretty wild. Yeah, no. A lot of anxiety for us, a lot of stress around like protecting it. I mean, it's like we've outsourced our brains and our identities to our digital selves through which our phone is the access portal. So Dude. without the phone, you can't access yourself. If you are your digital self and you got no phone, how are you going to get in touch with yourself? That's <laughs> That's where they want us to go to digital. I feel that, you know, everything's becoming like watch. Everything's becoming, you know, card, mostly card. I heard a New York Times podcast the other day with Elon Musk saying that they're already experimenting with brain chips. Yeah. That's, that, that's out of control. I mean, I'm not saying I'm against them necessarily. I'm just saying that if we yeah. want to use these things in a healthy way, then we have to make sure that we are not ourselves being used by them. Right. I mean, because the Internet is our karma, our, our technology, our technological lifestyle. That is the karma that we need to learn from in this phase of human evolution. Like this is this is what we're going through at the moment. Right. We are going through a phase in human history where we actively identify with a digital self. Yeah. In our course of coming to know ourselves, that is that is a game changer. And and it's it's, you know, far be it from me to say that that the digital self isn't more permanent than the physical or the mental self, right? Cause you got your ego, you got your body. These are both temporary manifestations of, of incarnation. The digital self, I mean, the Facebook ghost does linger on after you, after you die. And like that still exists out there. So in a way the digital self could be 
more real in a sense than the mind or the ego, in which case I'm just full of it and moving towards the digital self is closer toward moving to an eternal identity. Yeah, right? eternal, yeah eternal identity for sure. But, but it's contingent on the main maintenance of its infrastructure, which is precarious at best, right? I mean, like, how much energy does it take to run Netflix alone? It's some absurd, you know, amount of, amount of electricity just to keep them up and running for people to stream all the time. Like it's a massive amount of energy, which is highly contingent, right? Like it's, there's no, there's no magic switch we can flip to make sure that we have <laughs> endless energy forever, you know? So, so it's kind of a risk, you know I mean? Like it's kind of a risk putting a whole lot of stock into a digital identity. But, but I mean, this, this is in effect, you know, the, the lesson that we as a species are learning right now. It's like how to, how to use the tool in a way that is healthy for our own self-discovery and becoming. Um, I, I've seen a lot of cases where, you know, there's just misery attached to one's social media presence. Or the stories of people, or right, the Wikipedia rabbit hole. There's nothing, about, nothing wrong with Wikipedia. I love the, the knowledge sharing. But the Wikipedia rabbit hole is a real phenomenon where you just like start clicking links and you lose hours or something to, to the hole, right? You just keep clicking links further and further down and like on you go. I mean, those, those moments, like not to say that you're miserable in the moment, but there's opportunity cost associated with lots of screen time that, you know, it, uh, it may, may not be the most productive use of our energy which is why, I mean, I, I love your vacation with no phone, right? I mean, like, yeah, you're still posting once a day, but I mean, you're running a podcast, right? You're, you're an internet presence. So like, that's part of the deal for you. Um, and, and, you know, but I think that's a, a, a pretty common phenomenon that people take a break from their phone, right? You get away from it all, you unplug, you go camping for a weekend. Or like, imagine even, this, is, this, this might be a good business idea for somebody to run with. You just open a resort, but the one condition of staying there is that you turn your phone over. No devices, no device. Imagine how, how far out would that be, right? A vacation resort predicated on having no devices anywhere on, on the premises. I'm sure it'd be hard on, it'd be hard on some people for sure. I mean, there might even be like a withdrawal phase. I mean, there, no. it's a literal level of chemical addiction that we have to these things. Ugh. What kind, of chem what kind of chemical would you call that? Oh, I mean, it's like serotonin and dopamine are, are, um, are mood enhancers that our bodies yeah. naturally produce. Yeah. When, we, when you get what you want or when something feels yeah, good. Sure. Like, yeah, like yeah. There's, there's uh, um, an endorphin burst that yeah. you get that feels good and makes you want to keep doing that thing that provided the endorphin burst. Every time your phone buzzes in your pocket, that's what it's doing to your brain chemistry. No, I know. Straight it's up. It's what, you know? In your bloodstream and, and makes you feel better. And so it's like the world is no longer just competing with itself. We're not even just competing with ourselves and with each other for attention, right? If you're going to take my attention away from the screen that is giving me a steady stream of dopamine and serotonin, then you have to be more dopamine and serotonin providing than the screen. Otherwise, I'm going to pick the screen every time, right? Well, I mean, that's, that's the, the, the yeah. you pick the, you pick the yeah. sweeter, sweeter yeah. dessert, so to speak. Yeah. And it's the same phenomenon with dating, right? Dating apps, I realized in this, I, uh, dating apps are not made for dating humans. They're made for dating the app. Dang. Dating the app, right? Like how far out is that? Cause I mean, think about it. You might go on a few, <laughs> on a few Tinder dates or something like that, okay. but inevitably like, unless you've completely, sign off and delete all your profiles and whatever. I, I don't have any statistical information on this, but anecdotally I can say that people who use dating apps tell me that it, it's, with the exception of, you know, that one case where they met their soulmate and they're married and happy now, right? Like everyone goes back to the app. You go on a date here and there, you maybe go for a few dates, maybe a week or two or three, but you end up back on the app. Because the person you're dating is not just competing with other humans. They're competing with a chemical addiction that you have to, this, to the notifications you get from the dating app itself. Oh, I got a match. Oh, I got a message from this, from this person I've been talking to. It feels good. Uh, you feel validated in a way, right? Like, oh, I'm still sexy, right? I still got it. 
And, and so you're, you're getting these compliments in a sense that make you feel good about yourself and make you feel good on a chemical level from the app. And so when you go on a date with somebody, they're up against the addiction you have to the app. It's, wow. wild, it's a, the internet's a wild place, man. And it's, it's, it's uh, app life, screen human life, right? The tribe of screen. These are elements of human nature that we've never grappled with before. We've never created my, my friend, uh, Dr. David Munson. He's, he is a, uh, a lecturer at Texas A&M university he teaches rhetoric communication. Um, shout out, to David. Said, shout out to Texas A&M for sure. Yeah. Yeah, yep. uh, my, my home state, no less. Very cool. Um, yeah, and now I've lost that train of thought. Uh, there was something that he was going, that David often says that pertained to what we were just saying, and here it has escaped me, and perhaps it will return momentarily. I got distracted by uh, introducing him, right? And yeah. Not what I was going to say of his, say of his interest. Um, no, he, sounds like he's a great guy. Oh, he's one of the smartest people I've ever known. He's, 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 he has maintained an awareness of the illusory nature of time uh. for a long time. Like I grappled with this, with this, the idea of the one eternal moment for, for a long time. Right. And like, that is, that is something that I have, have moved in and out of awareness for the last 13 years. Um, and I'm certainly unqualified to speak um, on behalf of David's spiritual experience, but um, but it seems to me that he has been able to waken and stay awake in a way that I, I don't really see in um, a lot of other folks, right? I mean, not to say that there's anyone's behind or better than or worse off than. David has just got a very uh, compelling way of, of seeing the world um, and he's, he's a fascinating, fascinating human being. Yeah. Very cool. Hey, hey, did you tell him about your book, Volume One? Oh, yeah, yeah, he bought a copy. Oh, he's ahead of me, man. I'm gonna be there soon to get that. Hey, no fair. That's, that's, so, that's so cool, man. Is he still down there in Texas? Oh yeah, he's he's teaching uh, still. He's teaching argumentation, debate, communication. I, he teaches a bunch of classes. I can't keep them all straight. Wow, dude. How long did it take you to write up Volume One? Uh, volume one, uh, I wrote volume one probably between July 1st and, I don't know, the end of the month. It maybe took a month or, or three weeks or so to write volume one. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's good for you, man. There it is, guys. Check it out. Uh, it's called Being Volume One. This is one way you can purchase it. Um, you can go to Amazon too, right? To go buy it. Yeah. All the links on my website are links to the, um, Amazon sale page. Oh, that's, yeah. so cool. I mean, Amazon is, Amazon has revolutionized publishing in a way. It's, it's pretty amazing. Um, and obviously this is old hat in a lot of ways. A lot of people before me have figured out that Amazon is a great way to self publish your work. Um, but being an independent publisher has, uh, more virtue than I think perhaps it used to because, I mean, what were the reasons you used to go to a publishing company? You needed their resources for printing. You needed their resources for promotion. And, and I mean, here we are on the forefront of the most powerful promotional tool ever created. That exactly. costs only your, the cost of your broadband connection and obviously all the psychic elements of it as well. But, Straight up. Uh, but, but printing, I mean, Amazon is serving as my, my printer and distributor and I mean, it, it, as a as an author interested in publishing independently, it, it's a phenomenal tool. It, that's I mean, what I'm. I, I have my my thoughts about the fact that uh, yeah, there's huge wealth disparity, um, perhaps in our country, perhaps most obvious in uh, in the case of of Jeff Bezos. But um, <laughs> what can you do? I mean, this is this is the world we live in, and if you want to publish anything, um, short of getting lucky perhaps. I mean, I don't know how, how one makes a name for oneself to get recognized by a publishing company, if not by being published by what? A publishing company, right? So, so where do you start? Where do you start with so many writers, so many people trying to do work out there um, of the written kind that 
I mean, it's a massive industry, but the, um, the question of where to start is always, is always a difficult one. Um, so yeah, I, I got back from living at the ashram, moved into Denver, started writing and, you know, by, I, I written a few volumes, like what will be the subsequent volumes, um, between completing volume one and editing it and formatting it, which is also a massive undertaking of itself. Wow. Um, and got it out by August 31st. The book has been out for about a month now. Um, and uh, the the title is Being Volume One. That's it, man. Wow. Yo, dude, so the formatting, tell me about that. You said you, did you do that yourself or since you're the, you're an indie Arthur? Yeah, it's, uh, it's all through a tool that Kindle Direct Publishing has wow. available. Um, it's pretty customizable. It has some limitations, but as do all things. And, um, you know, you, you design the cover, you design the back, you uh -huh. design the content and you have to, I mean, it's not a huge, uh, it's not a, there's a bit of a learning curve. It's not, it's not a massive amount of work. Um, as long as you have the dimensions, right. But the, the, here's the trick, here's the trick. And this will put in perspective what I was kind of grappling with as a first time, uh, independent author, uh, independent publisher. Yeah. But I had to learn the lesson that 12 point font in eight and a half by 11 page dimensions is smaller than nine point font with five and a quarter by eight page dimensions, right? So the smaller font in the different dimensions is actually larger yeah. than the larger font in the other dimensions. Yeah. And so, yeah, so there, I mean, there was tricky stuff like that just in the process of, of getting the book um, formatted in, in a way that was both maximizing the use of space on the page um, to, make the, to make the text as big as possible while keeping it to one, one poem per page. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, and oh, that's cool, man. That's behind this. That's some behind the scenes stuff right there. Oh yeah. The, uh, the wonderful trials of, <laughs> oh, yeah. of ready self publishing. Oh, straight up. No, I, uh, I, so I could, uh, kind of relate on that because when I, when I, my website, I build my own website and I just learned, I didn't know anything about it. I did it myself. So I was always kind of learning new things here and there. And uh, just everything I've done from like CD baby where I upload my music to my podcast, just learning everything, man. So I know all about that, man. You, you learn as you go. You have to. Yeah. But that's, that's where we are. Yeah. So just always learning, always interesting opportunities to learn from the world around us. Good. And I think it's cool that you like the in. I think you got, I think it's cool that you like how you like the indie part of it because um, for me too, um, it, we got so much tools in front of us and I know that there's negativity with it, but for me, um, I use it for nothing but, um, positivity and just laughing and, you know, um, uh, like, um, like with my social medias and my websites and all that stuff, I just throw I just throw it out there and then that's it. And then, um, it's been weird. Um, I've been growing, man. And so, uh, it's just, amazing to see that growing i remember when i had 300 followers and i'm like what am i gonna do how am i gonna you know what's the what's the trick to get your name out there what's the trick to meet people and what i figured out was um networking and just constant networking and um just keep putting content out and it's weird it, it, it's just weird man i want it I, I think that like the audience that you're meant to have finds you, right? You, you keep just expressing yourself. And, and this is the trick, right? Like you said, you just use the internet, you use the tool um, in po for positivity. It, it's, the game is all about how aware you can be while you're doing what you're doing, right? It's, it's when you let your awareness of what you're doing slip and you just get captured by the phone or the internet or whatever it is that it becomes that it becomes um, a drain on one's life force. But if yeah. you can use it with awareness, I mean, like anything, it can be used virtuously. Yeah. Yeah, no. And uh, yeah, and I think it's so cool because right, we have all the tools in front of us and we can do so much. Like, it's so, I, I sell t-shirts, man. That's so crazy. People are buying t-shirts. It's nuts. People are listening to this. One week I got 60 streams. It's just like what sixty streams in one week, man. That's just unbelievable. And uh, 
you yeah, think? It's just unbelievable. So it, the audience will find you. I mean, the audience that is receptive to the energy that you're putting out there will find its way to you, right? I mean, that's yeah. what you have to have faith in, essentially. Yeah, have faith and just, you know, and then just, uh, I, you know, I'm just having fun and just spreading the word out there. And uh, yeah, that's what it's all about, man. And I thought it was so cool that when you said that uh, when you bought this book, you said you're already kind of on, are you on volume six already or you're past that? I, well, so my writing process is a little nonlinear. I kind of like write in large spurts and then like loop back on myself. Yeah. Here, and, there. and so, yeah, it, but there is a general forward progression of content. Like it does build. And so, yeah, at this point I am um, drafting volume six, uh, who knows what, you know, in volume six will actually be there. Anything could happen. Anything could happen. Right. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I've, I've got some, some work done in advance and I'll spend, you know, the next, uh, the next three or so years, um, putting these volumes out once every three or four months. And, uh, in the meantime, once I get volume nine finished, um, then, it'll give me some space to work on the book that I'm writing nature and consciousness, which is like a full length novel, um, about exactly that, about our nature as beings, as nature and consciousness. Um, and so that's, that's like a full length novel style work that, um, I manuscripted and, and need to go back and finish, uh, essentially. And so I was kind of like, I'm going to produce a bunch of, poetry this is what's coming out anyway so in the in the time of releasing the poetry I'll, I'll work on nature and consciousness and hopefully um within a year or two um I'll, I'll have that ready to go right on man can you give us what uh being volume one is all about can you give us like a an example of what it's about i could read you a, a verse from it if you would Thanks, like man. yeah dude i can't wait to have it in my hands to be honest <laughs> Oh, man. This one, I think, pretty well captures the, uh, the vibe of the book. Okay. It's titled Game. I remember clearly the first time I saw through the filmy screen of appearances. In the woods of Elgin, Texas, it struck me as I felt my body one with nature, reality is not a forward march of time, but a single infinite constant moment we perceive as past, present, and future. Because our physical embodiments are born, live, and die. Neither past nor future exists but for the mind and body. Birth and death are figments of the physical. All that is, is one eternal moment, and we are it experiencing itself from within. At first, I felt my whole life until that point had been an illusion, a trip into amnesia. I felt deceived, as if Descartes were correct, that God is an evil genius bent on deceiving us. But then, after sitting with that feeling for a while, bliss filled me to the brim, for epiphany hit me, that beings of consciousness, as conscious beings, we are that soul we call the moment or God and the God soul takes mortal form so that it can experience itself subjectively and come to know itself. This is the game, I realize. It loves to forget and rediscover itself over and over again, every time it takes new birth in form. Extraordinary. Perception is not deception. There is no evil intent. Consciousness is its love to know itself. Perception simply must be subjective because objectivity cannot perceive itself. The universe has no choice but to trick itself into thinking time is linear so that perception is possible 
and it may come to know itself through our forever playing the game of becoming and being. Dang, man. Yeah, I can't wait for that. Being volume one, guys. Wow. One eternal moment. This is the game. You nailed it. Guys, make sure you go purchase Being Volume 1. Yeah, I, I kept it as cheap as I could. Six ninety nine on Amazon. Um, so, yeah, please, uh, your support is appreciated. I will uh, use the proceeds of my writing to continue doing spiritual work, continue writing, to continue teaching yoga, and um, doing, doing the work of self-realization, both for myself, for my students, for people around me, right? Like that's, that's what this all is. It's all a game of dispelling the illusion of our separateness and supporting each other and the understanding that all is one. Yep. Well said, dude. Supporting each other, understanding all is one. That's what I'm all about, dude. Right there, guys. It's on Amazon, $6.99. Go copy a copy of that right now. Oh my, it's in stock. Make sure you get 10 copies. <laughs> get one for your brother. Get one for your mom and dad. Throw the people out the window of your car. <laughs> you know, I'm telling you, the holidays are around the corner, man. Six ninety nine. you can't beat that. That's what I'm telling you. Eris, you are amazing. And thank you so much for coming on. Um, my pleasure. I'm, I appreciate you, my friend. I'm blown away. And like I said, I'm coming by to come get that book this Friday, Good. man. Good. We'll social distance hand off the book. It'll be great. Yeah, yeah man. We'll social distance. And uh, I'm glad you're being safe. It looks like you're being safe from uh, last time we spoke. Staying healthy. Yeah. Safe and healthy, man. Looking good. Hollywood. <laughs> Guys, go check him out. Uh, his website, erisdayogi.com. Uh, go purchase his book. It's legit. I can't wait to go read it. I'm going to spend all weekend reading it, man. I can't wait. That's how long it takes me to read. So uh, I can't wait to read it. He's on volume six, too. This goes on Ariel. It's going to be out for a long time. Let's not, for, let's not worry about volume six. We got volume one out right now. Volume two will be out by, by New Year's. Oh, man. Man, you're getting me all excited. Check it out, guys. <laughs> Support the homeboy right here. I'm so excited. ArielENT.com. Instagram, ArielENT. P-O-D. Love each other. Love yourself. Take care of the animals, guys. Ariel's Entertainment Podcast. Thank you for listening, sharing, subscribing, and following, man. Thank you so much. God bless. Thank you, Eric. Thank, Thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you so much. Adios. Adios. Oh, yep. We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. Ariel's Entertainment Podcast is where it's all about. ArielENT.com. Blown away. ErisTheYogi.com. ErisTheYogi.com. Ariel's Entertainment Podcast. ArielENT.com. Thank you guys for all your support.